Uh, hello, my name is Alex Eve, and I'm an editor for the general development at the company of biologists. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Popsaselic, the director of the Centre for Epigenetics at the Van Andel Institute. Andrew, along with Anne Ferguson Smith and Ben Lenner, is one of the organisers of the upcoming Keystone Symposium meeting, Skirting Mendel Non Classical Mechanisms of Phenotypic Variation, Inheritance and Disease. This is a joint meeting with high order chromatin architecture in time and space and will take place from the 15th to 19th of March in Whistler, Canada. So, thank you for joining us. Um, let's start right at the beginning. So when you set out to create this meeting, what did you envision? Well, I, I think I, we envisioned a home for um, people that are really trying to get to the nitty gritty of what, what is a loosely defined term to phenotypic variation. So one way to think of it, very abstractly is how different could each one of us have been you know if we t if we could have that bizarre experiment where we could have birthed ourselves and gotten the same dna template 100 times you know would we have always come out the same and and the data that's out there that of people that have tried that in model organisms says that about you know about 50 percent of who we are is genetics and environment and that's what you know that's what the biological community has been chasing the last you know, the last five decades or what are those mechanisms? There's 50% that they can't trace to, to uh, environment and they can't trace it to genetics for most complex phenotypes that we talk about. And that relates to disease then as well. Um, but what we try to do here really is to bring together that collection of researchers that really is trying to, to get at the mechanisms of that. One of the other aspects that's really interesting um, is, you know, we live in a world of, of, of pollution, of changing environment, etc. And, and, and we know a lot of the systems that people are studying, and some of which are being brought to this meeting, are, are the influence of exposures, certain toxins, certain endocrine disruptors that manage to really reprogram our genome without changing the sequence. Um, but they have, they can have, you know, one generation effects, but even two, three, four generation shifts in, in the phenotype of the same identical genome and how it comes out. And of course, there's a ton of disease susceptibility issues attached to, to that, whether it's you know minor diseases like allergy um, or whether it's really major ones like, like serious autoimmunity or diabetes or heart disease. Okay, so which, which fields are you bringing together for the meeting? Uh, that includes many. Um, you know, there's germline biologists that are looking just at sperm and the egg, because some of these vari variation effects seem to come through the germline. So it seems that right. some fathers can predis even, you know, if we take genetically identical mice, so genetically identical fathers, you know, if you treat some of them with, a, with an, an exposure to plastics or to a high fat diet, you know, their, their offspring reproducibly shift. And we know these, there's epidemiological evidence that these kind of things happen in humans. So it's, you know, the germline biologists, the epigenomicists that like looking at, at how epigenetic um, effects are imprinted onto the genome. Um, it's biologists like myself that are classical physiologists that understand how the whole body works, how the tissues and organ crosstalk occurs to manifest disease. Um, it's people that don't care about disease, but are pure geneticists. Um, it's people working in different model organisms, flies, worms, uh, just cells. Keynote speaker works on bacteria and how bacterial communities adapt and respond and, are, uh, and, and the sort of the mathematical modeling of adaptability, of plasticity. You know, if we always came out exactly the same, we never have, would have made it through evolution as a, as a species, right? The species that are here on Earth are the ones that, no matter what the changing environment, they can adapt their phenotype and maybe the phenotype of their offspring. Um, let's see who else would love to bring, bring more. To, we have some, tw you know, sort of twin and human researchers. That's maybe our most underrepresented category at the moment, and that's maybe simply from the fact that. And Ben and I decided early on to really focus on people and, and uh, researchers that are really making headway and progress on deciphering the true mechanisms. And I think human biologists have the greatest challenge there. 
um, you can't do experiments on humans. So you can't get towards mechanism in the sense that we're trying to tackle. Of course, we get the greatest insight from the human researchers as far as relevance goes, as far as epidemiological correlates for that. We can identify the most variable regions in the genome and that. Um, but as far as picking apart the gene set work, networks, the, the epigenetic circuitry that's actually responsible for causing plasticity shifts, uh, for solidifying them, for creating a robustness against shifts, um, that's, that's super tough to do in humans. Um, what makes it different from other meetings on each of those topics? Well, you know, this the idea of phenotypic plasticity and, and, and variation, the way I often describe it is we're always the sideshow in a lot of other meetings, right? If you go to, you know, I study diabetes and obesity. If I go to an obesity meeting or a diabetes, there's always one or two sessions on this bizarre stuff, right? This non-genetic, non-environmental stuff. But we really are a sideshow. There's often not so many insightful questions because for people, it's it's a bit of a new way of thinking, right? Um, you go to an epigenetics meeting, same thing. There's really great hardcore epigenetics, histone modifications, dynamics of it, the molecular machinery that's necessary to put those, uh, establish that dynamic and the silencing. Um, we're then the sideshow, one or two sessions on these bizarre intergenerational phenotypes or plasticity and that. Um, and now there's a critical mass of researchers doing fantastic mechanistic work in the world and not really a platform for, more, for them all to come together. Um, once again, you know, this, the meeting kind of creates a home for that, but the impact kind of extends to everything. Every human disease, every human phenotype, um, every phenotype of every animal. You know, what I said about Stanislaus, even bacteria have a degree of plasticity. Um, at the population level, etc. You know, right. And perhaps, perhaps for the non-specialists, could you explain why it's so significant as a field? Um, well, I mean, a lot of people like to latch onto to, to kind of clinical relevance. For sure, for every human disease, um, you know, we can take you know identical twins. Many of them are not really that identical. Sometimes one of them gets a disease and the other doesn't. That's what we're studying is how, can, how could each one of us have been stably programmed a different way and had a different life, different character, different behavior, uh, but different disease susceptibility. Um, and what we are learning is, is if we had the power to do that 100 times, we'd get a different output each time. So we are just one example of ourselves, but we know nothing about that. We can't predict what kind of version of ourselves are are you, Alex, a, an extreme version of what could have happened? Or are you the normal version that would have come out kind of most, most often? Um, we're just beginning to get a feel for that landscape. But we want to understand that, you know, the mechanistic underpinnings that, that maybe one day we could predict with a blood test on a baby if they're the extreme version of themselves or if they're the most normal one, if they'll be the responder to some medications or, or not not because of their DNA sequence, but because of the way that, that their development was reprogrammed from the most probable norm. I don't know if that's really a lay explanation, but no, not lay, but non-special. Hopefully my uh, <laughs> hand waving helps. Uh, helps so we've touched, help upon some of the, communication. we've touched upon some of the subjects that will be covered. What tools and technologies do you expect to see at the meeting? I think there may be nothing that's uh, out of this world. You know, we're coupled together with the 3D high C, uh, 3D epigenome, um, nuclear, kind of nuclear architecture world. There, there's definitely going to be the high end mapping technologies for looking at 3D interactions of the nu within the nucleus. Um, those will be present in some of the talks and hours, and as will other epigenomic techniques. A lot of what you'll see are are model organisms, some of them common, like Drosophila, C. elegans, the worm, mouse, and human. Some a little bit more bizarre, which are models of, of bi-stability. Um, there's another worm, Pristianchus pacificus, that you know, genetically identical versions can come out as one or of two different body plants. A little bit like queen bees, worker bees, you know, yeah. the same genome, different outputs. But this is worms. There's one that 
that is, can grow a tooth and can kill other worms. And there's one that, that doesn't grow the tooth and just eats the bacteria around it. So some cool model organisms like that, that, that uh, inherently these lower organisms have, have massive power in the lab for, for, uh, for dissecting genetics of these kind of processes. Um, beyond that, as far as tool goes, I think maybe the biggest one is uh, open mind. Great, great. Um, so maybe you can tell me the story behind the name of the meeting, Skirting Mendel, why the reference to Mendel there? Oh, it's, yeah, well, you know, we, we batted around for, for a lot of times what to, what to call this type of variation. Um, do we just call it phenotypic variation? Well, that doesn't really work because that includes genetics. It includes environment because each of those have an influence, right? Well, why don't we just call it non-genetic or non-environmental variation? Well, it's, it's pretty long-winded, uh, so that doesn't attract much attention. Um, and in the end, some of these epigenetic effects, so some of these reprogramming effects, you know, we believe there's going to be genetic underpinnings for them. So we believe there's going to be there's going to be populations of people or populations of mice or flies that are more susceptible to being reprogrammed because of their genetic makeup, right? So the word using non-genetic or non-environmental kind of doesn't work because also you know, these systems probably react to environments. So in some sense, they're really coupled to genetics and coupled to environment. And so we, you know, I've gone in circles with many people talking about what do we call this besides just phenotypic variation, which is really too loose. Um, and then we said, well, one of the, one of the things that describes it is, is it's the patterns of inheritance is that they don't, it doesn't, it doesn't strictly fit the, the genetic model, which is most of the time is, is, is clearly Mendelian genetics. Um, so we just thought, well, skirting Mendel, you know, you just go anything that kind of goes around Mendel and affects phenotype really robustly and really stably, but doesn't obey his laws. So, and so finally, in a nutshell, could you summarize why you're excited about the meeting and who would want to go to it as well? Oh, I think, yeah, just reiterating what I said, it creates a home for people that are interested in this stuff. And there's a lot of excited people in a lot of fields, you know, from insect people. Um, you know, we have a talk on armadillos because you can get four identical twi twins, quadruplets, <laughs> um, and looks at, you know, we got technologies like single cell RNA-seq and that. And um, it's an exciting time for the field that's too used to being the sideshow. Uh, so I'm excited in, in, in just getting a collection of these people together in one spot. Um, and yeah, showing, uh, yeah, I guess and just sharing, I have a feeling it's going to be just uh, a constant hum of conversations here and there. It tends to be people that are, are the sideshow. So they, they are used to, uh, being kind of pushed to the side. And I think having, having us finally be the focus of our own attention will be pretty cool. It'd be great to be center stage. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I think we'll wrap it up there. I look forward to seeing you in Whistler. Yeah, perfect. Me too. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it.